Hi, it's Dave. Welcome. Today, I'm joined by Stephen Mark Ryan of Solving the Money Problem YouTube channel. Um, I've interviewed him in the past, and um, it's been great getting to know him over the years. I'll go ahead and link to the video or to the interview in the video description below. In today's video, I want to dive into Tesla's AI Day 2, into Tesla's Optimus robot, the future of AI, um, Tesla stock, and a lot of hot topics. Um, I want to welcome you on the channel, Stephen. How have you been? Fantastic, Dave. Great to be back. I look forward to our chat. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, great uh, connecting. So I'm curious, um, what was your reaction? I've watched a couple of your videos um, post um, Optimus. Um, you obviously <laughs> caught the bigger picture. So yes, help us, help yes. us see what's going on in your mind. What was kind of your reaction? And yeah, what's your kind of takeaway from Tesla AI Day 2? Well, I think the biggest takeaway for me is that they're going to do it. The rate of progress, the seriousness, the sense of extreme urgency in terms of executing on this project and their lead. I think one thing that a lot of people have just completely overlooked, they're getting fixated on the body, not the brain. They, yeah. they don't understand that what Tesla has taken, they've effectively transplanted the brain from their autonomous software, their computer vision into the Optimus humanoid robot. And they are light years. I mean, half a decade or more ahead of where anyone else in the world could possibly be in terms of a brain for a humanoid robot. The, the body, the movement, you know, the actuators, they'll figure all that stuff out. That's the easy stuff. But it's the brain that matters the most. Vision, perception, you know, planning and action in the real world. And this is something I think a lot of people are, are overlooking. And I don't see anyone getting this thing that Tesla has developed, the brain. They've got the foundational building block of AGI now in place. They are very serious about executing this. They have a very viable plan to actually scale up production, start with robots in their own factories. They'll be almost useless. In fact, they'll be worse than useless initially. They'll be a drag on productivity. They'll cost. But over time, Tesla can increase the capabilities. Once they're effective and adding valuable labor to their own factories, they immediately will have customers with similar needs that they can start selling these bots to. Then eventually their fleet scales, much like the vehicles. This thing, it's got a feedback loop, gets better and better over time. And ultra long term, AGI is probably, as Elon mentioned, an emergent property of what they're doing. And mm -hmm. I, I just don't see how anyone or any company catches up to Tesla from here. Now, I know this sounds like a deluded Tesla fanboy. I get this a lot. But I'm looking into the future and thinking, how does anyone catch Tesla? How? They will need to deploy millions today. They would need to deploy millions and millions of robots, whether vehicles and or humanoid, in the real world to start that data flywheel and the training effect. And I don't see it happening. Um, and I think yeah. actually you mentioned quite recently on a video, I think I was seeing your chat with Emmett Peppers. Mm -hmm. You can get everything that you need to know, the sum of human knowledge on the internet, that's great, but you also need that real world experience. I don't see where anyone captures that real world world stuff. And yeah. uh, at this point in time, I think a lot of people are getting caught up with the window dressing and not really understanding what's happening here. But <laughs> I am so excited for the future of Tesla. I just, I can't sleep. Uh -huh. My, Interesting. Last night I was yeah. laying awake for hours just thinking of all these possibilities. Um, yeah. And I think it's going to take a very long time and many years, maybe a decade or more before people really understand what's happening with this thing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it I, seems like Tesla's a very clear path to AGI. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, there's so much stuff going on. I feel like people are missing the, the storyline, you know, of the decade um, that will impact the next, you know, century. I think if people would see the track record of Tesla, the track record of Elon, seeing the industries he's disrupted and trust and just believe what Tesla is, says they're, they're doing right now, you know, mm -hmm. I think at AI Day, the, the problem was they didn't show something that was perhaps better than what's already out there, right? Of course. And people are like, yeah. what the heck, right? But what they did mm -hmm. show was what they're working on with the actuators of the design and all this, mm -hmm. you know, the AI brains, all this stuff, which is mm -hmm. uh, basically be best in class. Like no one's trying to do what mm -hmm. Tesla's doing at the scale that they're doing at. And I think mm -hmm. that's where if you just for a minute kind of pause and hold back your cynicism, your doubts and say, okay, if Tesla really is building the brain, and mm -hmm. they really are building all of you know the body and all the design for mass manufacturing. And you put these two together, what's going to happen? Um, and you can just map it out for the next five, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And the more you map it out, the crazier it gets, you know? <laughs> it's like, I don't even want to talk about past like 15 uh, years because uh, <laughs> it gets I all, it gets I know. all back up. It, it just, you'll get laughed off the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 So I'm curious, I want to dissect a little bit, um, 
of the assumptions you're making because mm-hmm. there's obviously certain things you're seeing and you're assuming um, that are connecting the dots for you, that Tesla's going to, you think, be successful with this bot, um, is going to release the brains that are going to, you know, basically surprise everybody. But what do you think are the key assumptions you're making or the key kind of, you know, points that you're believing that perhaps other people aren't seeing clearly? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest one, as I mentioned in the intro there, is that Tesla has built the foundation of AGI with Tesla Vision. The, the, The most important thing to solve for on the path to AGI is vision, perception, planning, and action in the real world. And Tesla hasn't completely nailed that yet, but they've built the seed. And it seems to me inevitable that if you run the clock forward far enough, what, what Tesla has today, if it continues to improve and evolve and get better and more capable and more intelligent, it just continues to go from, you know, basically useless to Tesla Q to below average intelligence to eventually human level and then eventually superhuman. And there doesn't seem to be any end in sight. Mm -hmm. And in addition to Tesla having built the foundation, it's getting close to impossible for me to imagine a realistic scenario in which anyone can catch up to Tesla. They just, like I said, they'll, they'll need their own fleet. They'll need that flywheel happening. So my argument is at some point AGI happens at some point, a humanoid robot that becomes more capable than a human in terms of intelligence will happen. It's just a matter of when and who does it. And I don't know on the timing, we're probably a couple of decades away from that point, but irrespective of exactly when it happens, uh, it seems quite clear that Tesla has an unassailable lead to make this happen. And I know it's super early to be calling that, but something remarkable would need to take place for me to, to change my position on that. And I'm open to changing my mind. It's also, I think, a point now where Elon has realized the value of AGI. Mm-hmm. A, a switch went at some point and he goes, oh, wait a minute. Wait, what we've got here with Tesla Vision, and he's had his AI concerns for years, AI in the yeah. wrong hands, which I lose a lot of sleep over as well. Mm-hmm. I think Elon's got to a point now where he he feels an ethical and a moral obligation to make this happen under Tesla rather than, you know, having Facebook attempting to do the same thing. And now they're really aggressively recruiting talent, taking a big risk as a company to show off very early technology prototypes and plans to recruit the engineers. And I think with each AI day, Elon mentioned the possibility of doing a podcast with monthly updates. It seems that Elon and Tesla are absolutely hell bent on making this happen and recruiting the talent that needs to to be there to actually execute on this. There aren't any other companies that are taking this so seriously, nor that have that fundamental building block. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's got, I think it's going to take a very long time for people to put the pieces of the puzzle together because until they start seeing proof, here's I'm sort of looking in the future and I can see what's inevitable, but I think it's going to take many years before other people start seeing enough evidence to to draw the same conclusions. Um, so yeah. I think there's a huge disconnect here and. I mean, EVs, pff, FSD, pff, energy, pff, pff, nothing. It's nothing. <laughs> yeah, Forget yeah. it. Forget, yeah. I mean, it's it's literally nothing. It is a spec compared to the potential of the humanoid robot. Yeah. The, the thesis essentially is if you can scale up the economy indefinitely with useful labor, things get super ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, I want to dive into that a bit more. Um, but before that, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about how Tesla with trying to solve FSD and FSD taking so long and being basically a harder problem than they anticipated. It led them to this path where they had to develop this crazy world-class AI team and infrastructure and compute. And basically they had to just like, you know, chew off a lot more than they had anticipated. But by doing that, it led, it leads Elon down this path where it's like, wait a minute, the next step is just like a humanoid. And then you've got potential AGI and, it's just mm-hmm. exactly what he had um, hoped for in, in a sense in the past with OpenAI, where he wanted to mm-hmm. steward kind of, you know, the direction of AGI in the right way. But now he mm-hmm. gets that opportunity in Tesla. And it's fascinating mm-hmm. how this stuff works out, you know? You couldn't have predicted this yeah. probably like, you know, yeah. uh, six or seven years ago, it's a bit hard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I yeah. absolutely agree. I think at some point, like I said, a light's gone off in Elon's head and he's like, oh, okay, this is perfect. Let's go. Yeah. Um, so why do you think Tesla would be in the lead for potentially solving AGI compared to, let's say, Google? Like, what's your take on, you know, uh, that Tesla versus Google race or open well, AI or I think others? The real world application. So as I mentioned, you can crawl the internet. There's a lot of 
knowledge available there. We can train on images and recognition and categorization and blah, 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 and rules based. But when it comes to interacting in the real world, I don't see anyone like Google, Amazon, pick your large tech company that has anything at the scale that needs to be out there to actually collect enough data to have a meaningful impact. So if Google wanted to try and attempt to catch up to Tesla, they'd probably need to build out their own fleet of autonomous vehicles. And I mean, millions of them to start getting some data in that form. Or if they really wanted to, they could just start with a humanoid robot. But I think they'd be at a disadvantage because there's a lot of valuable, useful information in, and, and they could really develop great computer vision just through vehicles. Tesla's so far ahead, so many years ahead already. And it's just a feedback loop. The more time they have, the more data, the more efficient their neural networks get, the better and more capable. I find it very difficult for to imagine a company like Google or another big tech company having a legitimate chance of running Tesla down unless they go, you know what, F it. Put $100 million, billion in to this project ASAP, immediately. Let's just do whatever it takes to start trying to run down Tesla. And I, I think the, the amount of courage that would be required to do that as a company, can you imagine how Google investors would feel if they said, we're going to deploy $100 billion just this year to start our own flywheel to try and catch Tesla on this crazy humanoid robot that most people don't think will happen. I think Tesla, the, the agility of the company, the DNA of the company almost allows them to take these kind of risks without anywhere near the same penalty as another company would have. They still have that startup culture. Yeah. And I think most of the big techs are behemoths now. They're not really at that point where they're willing to, to bet the company on something or, or take these huge risks and make the investments. You know, yeah. Google's got some great AI stuff, but I just they've got tiny little elements. They've got great language and, and search and, and stuff like that. But I just don't see any other big tech companies that have anything comparable to what Tesla's built with their vision system. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Do you see yeah, yeah. It? How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I was having lunch um, uh, on AI Dave with some uh, subscribers, followers, and um, someone was commenting that Apple would never do what Tesla's doing with public FSD beta. Like it would be just, oh, just no way. Would just, their brand destroy would destroy their image, yeah, their no brand, chance. everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tim Cook and, would be vomiting violently just thinking about an idea like that. Exactly, yeah. and and that like kind of you know exemplifies the difference between Tesla and you know an Apple, where Elon's like, "Hey, I drive the latest, you know, craziest beta version that might kill me," <laughs> and he's doing it himself, yeah. and it's such a such a contrast to to running a huge, you know, typical let's say multi hundred billion dollar company. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I guess the question is, you know, with Google, OpenAI, others, will there be an AGI like on the computer that's different than an AGI in real life? Or do you think they'll just intersect and, and just be one? Do you think mm -hmm. that eventually Tesla can compete and overtake, you know, the online AI experts and those companies mm -hmm. and what they're doing by mm -hmm. somehow their real world AI develops so fast that it just en engulfs, you know, the online, you know, presence too, or, you know, how do you kind of foresee this playing out, you know, in the next five or 10 years? I definitely think there will be a convergence of these capabilities. I don't know exactly how it plays out, but I do have a general hypothesis that at some point, what Tesla or anyone else is building in terms of intelligence becomes better at learning. It's not just learning, but it becomes better and more efficient at learning, more generalized, a lot more streamlined. Like human beings are a great example of, you know, millions of years of biological evolution. Our neural networks are relatively efficient. You know, a baby only needs to take the same action so many times to realize, you know, and they can move through the world in a certain way. Don't do this, don't do that. And humans are the same. We can watch somebody perform an action and then a few attempts, you know, when the, this thing at the AI day, that little love, I, I tried to do the, the hands, right? I've never tried to do that before. And I'm like, you know, like <laughs> what, what? Uh -huh. It took me three or four attempts to get the rough shape. And then about five, 10 to attempts before I could just slam it out. So we have relatively efficient neural nets in terms of learning. I see it getting to a point with, um, you know, the, the AI that Tesla's developing that it'll be able to, to pick up and learn things so much more efficiently and quickly that we're just, we're, we're very early days now. Training isn't as efficient, I think, as it will be ultimately. And at that point mm -hmm. in time, I think whatever the gaps are in your capabilities will be very quick to, you'll be able to very quick to sort of fill those in. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that this stuff will converge. I think it's definitely a possibility that maybe there's like an online AGI that's super capable and maybe Tesla's humanoid robots much more capable in the real world. But I see those abilities converging over time. And, you know, it seems to me like you can effectively take your neural networks and kind of layer them in. It's just like the brain that's evolved over time. We have our basic brain and then things have got more complicated and sort of lay it on and lay it on and lay it on. 
I think that's probably how AGI will go as well. Start yeah. with, you know, some very basic capabilities and stack things on and on and on. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think at AI day, the Q and A, Elon said something about, I think having the data and the compute, um, you know, it's like they're, they're in the lead, at least with real world AI. But when you think about it, there's potential that the amount of data you accumulate in the real world, um, it's just could be so massive compared to if you're just isolated in an online environment, because exactly. like, for example, with open AI's GPT three, like sure, they, you know, scrape all of Reddit's, you know, whatever pages, all that, but that's something Tesla could do too. You know, it's like, it's not mutually exactly. exclusive per se, but to be like, to have, let's say potentially hundreds of millions of robots interacting with daily mm -hmm. tasks and mm -hmm. communicating and doing the actual labor that humans mm -hmm. do and actually almost acting like a human too, right? Like that mm -hmm. amount of data, I don't think you can compare with an online only type of data set. I you know? agree. It's just like- I, I feel like it's like a, online is almost like a two dimensional world exactly. versus the three dimensional world. You know, you, there's so much that is just missing from the online world. It seems like the online AIs seem to be pretty good at mastering certain tasks with just brute force, a lot of information. It seems fairly simple. Um, you can just brute force your way and it's very quick for AI. There's a little AI somebody sent me recently where it can transcribe a video and then try and figure out what the message and the meaning of the video. It gives you a tiny little summary and it writes, mm -hmm. this video is about blah, blah, blah. And I ran it on a few of my videos. I'm like, holy crap, this is incredible. In the matter of like two or three seconds, it analyzes an entire video, spits out a response. But that's very basic compared to traversing the real world, which is complicated and chaotic and uncertain. And there's infinite variety there. You know, there's only so many correct answers to what's one plus one, it's two, right? Whereas it gets into the real world and things just take on an entirely new dimension. Yeah. And yeah, I think, I think you're right on that point. Yeah. I mean, it's also, you learn things in the real physical world in a different, more in different way than you do just online. Like let's say someone says something to you and they give you a weird face. And there's, there's mm -hmm. more context and nuance and more information to take in than just, mm -hmm. you know, you say something funny online and you get a, a, yeah. a emoji reaction or something, you know, that amount yeah. of data is so limited compared to mm -hmm. what you intake in the physical world. I think there's a, mm -hmm. there's a, um, you could make a, a hypothesis or argument that you need to have real world AI to get to AGI. Like the amount mm -hmm. of data you need, you have to get that in the physical world because that's where the bulk of the data will lie. And that if you just put yourself in the computer, like you know, a lot of these other companies are, you're gonna hit a local maximum. You're not gonna have the data that a real world, mm -hmm. world AI company like Tesla has. If that's the case, then it's like, oh my gosh, it's like Tesla's AI future is gonna be insane. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I tend to lean toward that uh, thesis too. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm so excited. Yeah. Um, so uh, economic potential of the humanoid robot. So um, where, where does your brain go in terms of how big this could be? <laughs> well, honestly, the answer to that question is when we start butting up against the laws of physics and the amount of available matter and energy in our solar system. I know that sounds ridiculous, but mm -hmm. that's where my brain goes first and go, okay, there's, that's where the real physical limitation actually is. We've got to take a step back from there and, and is there an arbitrary limitation? I don't know. I generally don't have an answer to that. My suspicion, given the history, what's happened with world GDP and technology sort of building on the back of previous innovations, it seems probable that there isn't a, a reasonable limitation to the size of the economy. If we can create useful labor, we can create useful things. I don't see an arbitrary limitation. And that's a pretty <laughs> mind blowing and or disturbing sort of reality to contemplate because if you think about the potential, what if we could increase the size of the global economy by 10 X or hundred X or a thousand X or 10,000 X or more, which I do believe is it's possible and feasible just a matter of when it just gets absurd. I mean, it, it truly gets just absolutely absurd. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mind blowing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, do I'm, you have any thoughts to a limitation in terms of like what could actually happen? I'm, I'm yeah. I mean, find one. Yeah. I mean, so on a tangent here, I think um, with AI and robots, there's this bias people have as humans. And it's, I think it's a natural kind of almost self-preservation bias where it's hard to imagine 
robots being smarter than you. You know, you think you are the top of the, you know, structural universe um, mm -hmm. species that you are the smartest. And to think that, you know, a robot or AI or computer can be smarter than you, I think that's like so unnatural. It's like almost death, you know, to the person. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's easier for people to think that robots can be stronger physically than them. It, it's mm -hmm. like, you can say, oh, okay, you look at their metal body and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. But to be smarter, that's where I think um, most of the, I would not say pessimism, but the um, not tapping into what I think the, the potential of robots will be in AI. If, mm -hmm. if you can't see that they'll be smarter than you, you're not going to see the potential of the future, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you kind mm -hmm. of lay that down and you say, okay, what if these neural nets advance so much that, yeah, robots are smarter, AI is smarter than me in most, almost everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I still think there's going to be certain things that humans do that um, are so almost, I would say, I want to say mystical or supernatural, but are beyond perhaps reason or rationale that will be uniquely mm -hmm. human. I still think that mm -hmm. that's going to happen. But in terms of like sheer intelligence and capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's very plausible that these neural nets, once they eclipse human, you know, intelligence, then it just exponentially goes up where you can't even compare, you know, their intelligence mm -hmm. to human intelligence. And then you get into the scenario where they can make more robots themselves. They can create their own factories. Yeah. They can design things yeah. that we can't even understand what they're designing. Um, that's right. And yeah. there is this basically self reproducing, you know, species almost. And that's mm -hmm. where you're like, oh yeah, there is no end to that mm -hmm. potentially. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where, when we talk about the potential of the economy, I'm like, yeah, what's the potential of a self reproducing robot that design, mm -hmm. the designs are getting better and better than you, you don't even understand mm -hmm. the designs as humans, yeah. right? <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, of course that, that poses some potential dangers and all that stuff, but in terms of pure, you know, potential economically, we're talking about something mm -hmm. that has never happened in the history mm -hmm. of the world. You can't even, I think, compare it almost, you know, to anything that's happened. Mm -hmm. It's it's just something mm -hmm. so crazy. Um, I was thinking about this, um, maybe you'll have some, some, some thoughts on this, but I was thinking um, this past week, humans have this limitation of reproduction where it's mm -hmm. extremely difficult, not just to reproduce, but to care for your offspring. There's so much, mm -hmm time and energy, there's like health and safety and all these issues um, that you can't just reproduce a thousand offsprings, you know, and then have them do a thousand yep. each, right? <laughs> like that's just <laughs> not how humans work. Um, yeah. But that limitation doesn't apply to robots, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't have to clean up for them. You don't have to, you know, mm -hmm. breastfeed them. You don't have to do anything. They're just there. Yep. And as the mm -hmm. brains get exponentially smarter and better and whatever, and as they are able to, you know, create their own robots, then you've got this mm -hmm. crazy limitless reproducing situation. It's just, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, mind boggling. Yep. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm not sure if you've mentioned this, but I certainly have, have come to the conclusion that the Tesla humanoid robot is the final product. Yeah. Because as you mentioned, being able to create better versions of yourself, not needing to be trained, not being an infant, just out of the box capable. Yeah. Just it get the implications are really ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I call it the the product that ends all products. It's like the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is the end. It yeah. really is. Um, what's interesting also is like Elon is chooses not to produce like a dog or some other types of robots. He's going for the human robot, like humanoid mm -hmm. robot, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of it is his focus, where he's like you know, we have a shot at this, we're going to go for it. He understands it's mostly about the brains. Um, another part of it is I think he understands once they put it out and they can get a lead and get millions of these, these things out, how can you like, who can catch up? You know, it's like whoever's first and why start with the dog when the competition is going to come up with a humanoid robot, you know, it's like, exactly, it's pointless, yeah. like go with the real thing, get it out to millions. And then it's like, I don't say it's game over, but it's like, yeah, your lead will just grow and grow, it seems like. Yeah, I think Elon said something in the, the AI Day 2 presentation about the fastest possible path to a useful robot, whatever that is. So yeah. he's, he's had that thought, why start with anything other than the final product? 
let's just get something that's useful as fast as possible, then we can iterate and improve. And yeah, the sense of extreme urgency uh, that I really got from AI Day 2, it seems like Elon is like, okay, this is the absolute priority. We've got to get this done as fast as possible. And he senses this first mover advantage. There's a point where it's unassailable. If you get enough of an advantage, you just don't get caught. Um, you know, it just, it's just like a slug trying to outcompete a human, you know, once you get to a certain level of capabilities, why even bother? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I totally got that at AI day too, is Elon didn't say it ex explicitly, but it was implied that the robot, the humanoid robot is, is way, way on a different level than anything else, you know, <laughs> like FSC, mm -hmm. all that stuff is just preparation, yeah. you know, stepping stones to get to this, mm -hmm. um, to the robot. And it, it's, it's interesting how, how clear Elon is thinking on this, you know? Um, and to me, it's, 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 it's obvious, it's clear, but it just, most CEOs wouldn't, I think, think so clearly on it and make the next logical step which is to bet the whole mm -hmm. company or, you know, your everything yeah. on it. And it just seems like he sees it clearly and he does what logically he needs to do. Um, mm -hmm. It makes so much sense, right? But <laughs> it's like so abnormal, it seems like in, you know, the business or, or tech world. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how about timeline? What are your expectations on, you know, when Tesla can start using this in the factory in a useful way, but not just that, what are the stepping stones? Like, what are the next steps? Do you think that it'll just be factories and then, you know, selling to businesses, or do you think they'll use it for like last foot delivery, train the, you know, the robots to do that before getting to the home or, yeah. I mean, do you think three to five years, like Elon said, is a realistic you know, timeline mm -hmm. to get in the home? Like, what are your thoughts on timeline? Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of timeline, I do actually, my Tesla valuation model has the first Tesla bots being sold to customers hypothetically in, in the best case scenario in three years. And I don't expect any meaningful volume for about five years. And this was a fairly bullish estimate. So the timelines mm -hmm. match fairly closely. I was also expecting the hardware about $25,000. So Elon and I are kind of guessing around the same timing, but of course there's so many unknown unknowns. It's very difficult to know for sure when this will be commercially viable. I think the strategy that Tesla will deploy, obviously their own factories is the first place to, to nail useful productive labor. But I think if Elon and the team at Tesla can identify any other areas where they can become useful quickly, maybe last mile delivery is actually not as hard as you might think, they may actually go after these opportunities as well. I think Tesla's probably gonna want, once they've got useful humanoid robots in their own factories, they really will be desperate to get them into other applications, not just yeah. other factories, but where's the next thing? Because once you're in a factory doing useful labor, you can get better and better and better. You don't need to be, you can now start focusing on what else can we add new capabilities that this thing currently can't do at all and, and be very aggressive in those. So I'm not sure exactly in terms of, I'd guess probably late this decade, there'll be some sales to other commercial customers initially. And I think it's really the 2030s and beyond where we start to see the Tesla bots being used in a much broader range of applications mm -hmm. and becoming increasingly more capable, finding its way into homes. Probably 2040s is where things become super insane, where the Tesla bot can be useful in at home, okay. caring for elderly everywhere. Wait, wait. So if, if I can get a Tesla bot in my house in, let's say, five years, what is it going to be able to do then, do you think? Not a lot. I really? think it'll be able to huh. do some useful stuff. Yeah, I yeah. think, don't get me wrong here, like it'll be useful, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't expect that in terms of being super, it's kind of going to be like having your kids help out around the home, right? They can be useful, but they can also not be super helpful. I think if Tesla can get a few basic tasks down, that'll be great. But my expectation, maybe I'm a little bit bearish on this, I don't think that there's going to be major utility with a Tesla bot in the home, probably until late this decade, maybe around the turn of the decade in the best case scenario. That's not Got to it. say that it may not be useful for some people. If you just want a robot that can take out your trash, you might be able to have that a little bit sooner. But the, the number of different tasks that you'd want a robot in the home to be capable of doing before you'd really think of it useful from a consumer point of view, there's a broad range of things, you know, doing your laundry, yeah. loading, unloading, folding clothes, these kind of things. I think it's going to be a few years before Tesla's really useful in that regard, because there's a, there's a point where if you have a robot and it's not able to fold your clothes properly, it's making a mess and it's unloading the dishwasher, but it's dropping forks all over the place. I think there's going to be a few years where Tesla's kind of at that level, uh, especially with the manipulation. People don't, I think, appreciate how incredible a human hand is the sensitivity, the way that we can pick up an object, just look, know exactly how, how firmly to grasp and stuff. 
that's stuff that Tesla doesn't really have any progress yet. Like it's really early days. They're just figuring out the sort of, you know, very basic movements. I think it is going to take a while to iron that stuff out. But the more bots that are deployed, the more the flywheel continues. I think the capabilities will grow very fast and surprise people. I think it will disappoint people in the first few years, but then out of nowhere, much like we've seen breakthroughs with AI, you know, yeah. image categorization and then with Chesco, these kind of things. The capabilities are decent and then out of nowhere, you just have this, this vertical moment where it just becomes almost superhuman. What are your thoughts on timing? I'd love to know. Yeah, you know, it, it, I actually, uh, I resonate with some of that um, because some of the, the, the in-home tasks are super hard, like cooking, you know, chopping stuff mm -hmm. and like, yeah, just, and to be useful, to be really useful in the house, you need to do like that type of stuff, you know, you can't mm -hmm. just vacuum. You can have a Roomba for that or, yeah. you know, yeah. like, um, so the high value stuff is super hard. My kind of question mark, and I was looking into some of the, um, the new, um, AI, um, occupancy networks and they call them, call them NERF, so neural radiant mm -hmm. fields. Um, but they're basically rendering 3d spaces, um, super mm -hmm. efficiently now. And mm -hmm. I wonder if in the next three or four years, there will be, um, huge advances in this field of basically 3d, you know, modeling, rendering, rendering, mm -hmm. you know, control all that stuff inside that environment to the point where what we have now is just like kids play. It's like almost nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that type of breakthrough will enable the robot to be pretty much superhuman in terms of mm -hmm. its ability to move around um, in mm -hmm. its environment. Like right now, it's hard to hard to imagine that a robot superhuman mm -hmm. in its ability to move around because we just don't have mm -hmm. something to compare it with, right? Um, but if you track the progress and the speed of how fast AI is improving and how this mm -hmm. field is just like breaking through with a lot of things with, especially with um, real world AI, it's just, mm -hmm. there's gonna be a time, I don't know when that is, whether it's in four, three or four years or five or six mm -hmm. years, it doesn't seem like it would take longer than five though. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that could be one of the breakthroughs. There might be another breakthrough that's needed to actually, you know, function in a superhuman dexterous way to be super, mm -hmm. you know, helpful, but it seems like there's, there's a, we're not too far away. Um, but mm -hmm. part of my brain, you know, is still like comparing it to now. So I'm like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. that doesn't seem realistic. Mm -hmm. Um, but mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a trippy next, you know, five or 10 years, like every year we're just oh, yeah. like, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm having these moments now. Some of the progress mm -hmm. with AI, like Dali and Dali too, just yeah. my brain mm -hmm. breaks. I'm like, we've gone from AI, basically some cool language stuff, you know, next minute, here's a prompt and you create some unique and novel art. And I didn't expect that you'd be able to type a few text prompts in, in 2022 and have AI render a bunch of scenes and scenarios. You'd, I just didn't expect that to happen. So you're absolutely right in terms of breakthroughs who knows exactly on the timing, but there is that point with capabilities where out of nowhere, it just goes from decent to just superhuman. And I think that's going to surprise a lot of people when it happens. I just don't know exactly what the timing looks like. Yeah. Yeah. What do you expect? Like, let's say next year at Tesla AI day, 2023, what kind of Optimus kind of robot would, would you expect them to demo? I th that's a good question. I think the capabilities will be vastly improved in terms of its ability to move and manipulate objects. So we'll probably see some demos where there's much finer motor control. The first version looked great, but obviously needs some work. But uh, I think we're going to see a lot better ability to move through an environment, to manipulate objects, um, and maybe some other examples of, of behavior that seems intelligent or might be surprising to a few people. Um, manipulating things that at this point in time require an insane amount of dexterity. I think that's going to be a big tell is how much progress Tesla makes there. I think the brain itself is going to continue to get better. We've seen the progress with FSD. We know what's kind of happening there, but it's physically moving through the world and manipulating objects that I think is going to be a big focus um, because what we saw at AI Day 2022, most people are pointing and laughing. They don't really understand how quickly this project came together, but I think that's going to be the massive improvement that we see, at least that we can notice. Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you think? What are your thoughts? You yeah, I, I think the next few years are going to be exciting for those who see the potential, but it will be a bit, I won't say slow, but 
like I'm not expecting a crazy robot next year. You know, it's yeah. Um, as I long agree. as they yeah. they solve some major problems like locomotion, they could actually have a mm -hmm. decently moving around robot. Mm -hmm. um, the robot can pick up stuff, you know, put it in mm -hmm. places confidently, um, mm -hmm. and do some basic tasks. And mm -hmm. it's actually they're doing their own actuaries, their own you know neural nets. All this stuff is working. Then I think that's mm -hmm. a huge success because that's yep. the next building block for the next year, right? To, to, to iterate mm -hmm. on that. But yeah, again, it's like, it's, I think the AI role is going to be the perfect example of like this crazy S curve where, you know, we, we mm -hmm. see some, some progress and um, those who see the, the future are going to be excited about it, but others, mm -hmm. it'll be like yep. every AI day for the next few years will be like, yep. um, will be, um, what? uh, <laughs> Test the cue like um, trigger. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I 100% I agree. I yeah. think that yeah, the, the progress. If you're in the know, if you really know what's going on, you understand. You'll be blown away. But I think the general public perception for the next few AI days is like, is that seriously it? Really? Mm -hmm. a whole, you spend yeah. a whole year, and that's all it can do. Um, but yeah, I think if you understand the difficulty of, of some of the underlying problems, I think Tesla is going to be making incredible progress. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's funny how a lot of the people probably who are ridiculing Tesla Optimus now, who knows, in 10 years, they'll probably, maybe the Optimus probably world will be making them lunch, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, or, or spooning with them house. in bed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, you said, I, I think it was in one of your videos or maybe a tweet, you said that Facebook and Google, um, them if they moved if they had a first mover advantage in AI robots, that would be like a nightmare scenario for you. Why, yeah. why, what's your kind of reasoning behind that? Uh, I don't see them as competent custodians of what will ultimately become AGI. Um, I think that both companies have horrific red flags wherever you look. Um, I'm not to disparaging them completely. I mean, Google makes some great products. Facebook's made some cool stuff as well, but Facebook, I mean, I probably shouldn't even really need to explain why we don't want them developing AI. I mean, the amount of mistakes, it's like, no offense to Mark Zuckerberg, but he's, he's not the kind of CEO I want anywhere near that kind of technology. Even if he means well, the track record, not so great. It appears to me at this point in time that Google is thoroughly infected by the woke mind virus. So too with Facebook. And I know it's very controversial to say this, but I don't think most of the people at these companies are thinking clearly. I think they know what is absolutely best for the world, the arbiters of what's true and moral and right and wrong. And I don't want people who, who have that sense of, we know exactly what's right for the entire world in charge of something that could potentially, you know, disrupt life as we know it. There's a lot of scenarios in there, which I think well-meaning, well-intentioned people in those companies could steer things in a very negative direction. And just imagine if there was, you know, humanoid robots under the control of Google and, you know, a couple of years ago, the plague, Next minute, Google's like, yeah, we can help send these robots to keep people at home. You know, I just, there's a lot of scenarios like that where I know Elon would be like, get effed. I'm not, no, that's wrong. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I feel like Elon Musk has his heart in the right place. He has good intentions and he makes good decisions and looks at as many of the possible implications as he can reasonably consider. And I've seen very many, many examples where companies like Google, Facebook have not done that. Um, yeah. And I don't think they mean harm i just think that sometimes you can be a well-meaning moron or you can mean well and do really bad dangerous things so yeah, I, yeah. My, my worst scenario was any company developing agi that had any red flags whatsoever <laughs> it sounds like elon fanboy coming out but of all the people on the planet i think elon is the man to be sort of the custodian of, of what we're developing with agi here yeah, yeah. i've i've I used to think that no harm with age AI, everything's going to be fine. I used to have long heated debates with my father like 10, 15 years ago. I started reading into it more and completely reversed my position from being like, oh, it'll all be fine. Like some of the AI people still say today to wait a minute, <laughs> there's a million ways this can go wrong. And um, I'm very cognizant now that in the wrong hands, even if they're well-meaning hands, things could pan out in a way we really don't want. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I agree with a lot of that. Um, I think what most people might not, I think, be in touch with, and I could be wrong with this, but my opinion is the typical route that AI advances, heads into AGI, all this stuff, the typical route is not a very good route. Like you're talking about a typical company run by mm -hmm. typical bureaucracy, mm -hmm. run by mm -hmm. all this stuff, like 
collusion with the government and we have mm -hmm. very little privacy, very, very little rights. You have a mm -hmm. scenario that's just deteriorating, but that would be kind of the normal path, you know, um, of technology. Mm -hmm. And I think yep. what we have here is an abnormal path where somehow a guy who is well-intentioned and actually mm -hmm. like has his brain on the right way, seeing things mm -hmm. clearly has got in a position where he could actually influence the direction mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. future of the world in a sense. Yep. And it's so abnormal and it's so optimistic for the future, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise you're looking at a pretty grim situation. And I don't think yep. people understand like the, the two paths, you know, and how, how yep. abnormal, you know, unlikely this path really is until just recently. And here we're at, we're at the cusp of this potentially mm -hmm. happening. And that's mm -hmm. like, I think one of the, one of the underrated missed stories of the entire decade, you know, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, fascinating stuff though. Yep, I agree. And just one final point on that. I think this is part of the reason why Elon has latched onto this with such a sense of urgency, because he knows he's the man to be. Yeah. <laughs> As you said, he's the outlier. It's like, wait a minute, I'm in a position to do this. <laughs> Thank goodness yeah. it's not Zuck or somebody like that all in. This is the priority because I think Elon's yeah. now competing against the risk of that scenario in which this ends up in the wrong hands, even if they're well-meaning. And yeah, so I think that's added a lot to his his sense of how quickly this needs to happen and how wholly Tesla needs to commit to making this happen. Yeah. Um, if we look back at the pandemic, I mean, I think it's, at least for me, it's um, the true colors of some of these companies came out with their collusion oh, yes. with the government, censorship. Oh, yes all this stuff where it, it's like it stunning huh. to see. Yeah. The, just I, the, I, mean, um, I know, I know your eyes are open, even though you don't, you know, you don't go on your rants cause you don't want to you know, <laughs> offend your entire audience. But I noticed that your eyes are open and, and it, it was a very disturbing time. It yeah. really was. I just I mean, went, are you serious? Like, mm -hmm. are, is this actually happening right now? And the worst part to me is that people weren't noticing. Yeah. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just like, are you guys, are you guys seriously not seeing what's going on right now? And it's not troubling you at all. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, the amount I've never of been so simultaneously gone. Yeah. The amount of hubris from, you know, like some of these, not just, like just some of the biggest tech companies, also the biggest, you know, you have pharma government all coming together, uh, dictating, know. you know, just what it just, it just, ah, uh, it's just, yes. <laughs> and to imagine <laughs> that they would be the stewards of AGI, you know, and what yes, would happen. I mean, exactly. Yeah, that's you know your yeah. nightmare, I guess, um, scenario. Yeah, there. exactly yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would say one of the reasons why you're probably and myself included why you're so um, excited and um, you believe in you know the potential of AI robots under Tesla under Elon just because it's one of the few scenarios where it actually looks potentially good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an extremely consequential situation we find ourselves in yeah um what happens if if something happens to elon do you think tesla can steward agi uh, potentially like in the future ethically morally and in a, in a good way or do you think you know just deteriorate i think that tesla does have the right dna elon is radically transparent super honest everyone who works at tesla knows what the guy's about and i think the culture at tesla is unique among any company on earth, at least at the scale to be aware of a company at all. I think that's a good sign. Of course, who knows over time what could happen if Elon disappeared tomorrow, but I'd be willing to bet there's probably maybe a 50, 50 chance that things continue in the right path just because of the DNA of Tesla as a company. I think the vast majority of engineers that are working at Tesla really want to have a positive impact on the world. They could get more money working somewhere else, a cushier job. But they really care about what they're doing. And I think, Everything, the culture at the company really comes from the top down. And so I think that the way that the culture at Tesla has been built is probably a very good sign that even if Elon did disappear tomorrow, Tesla will continue to do mostly the right things, becoming from a good place. Then again, you know, what, 20 years ago, do no evil was the Google motto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we find ourselves now in a situation where I know I could literally get this interview deleted from YouTube by saying just a single sentence <laughs> like that. So uh -huh. never say never, but... Um, I am fairly hopeful that Tesla does have the right DNA now that even if Elon were to disappear or step back or something happened, 
I think that there'd be at least a 50% chance that they do the right thing over the long term. And I also have a, a sense of hope that they're far enough along with both autonomy and also the humanoid robot that they still should be first to get there. Obviously, it'll be a lot more challenging. So maybe I'm naive and a bit optimistic, but I'm fairly hopeful now. And a few years ago, I really was losing sleep, like a yeah. lot of sleep thinking about where things could go. So what do you think? You think Tesla would be able to make it? They got the right DNA or maybe Yeah, not? I mean... <sighs> I think over time, I'm probably a little bit less optimistic. Um, I think mm -hmm. just being in charge of a large corporation, you have money, you have like, you know, quarterly reports, you have pressure, stock, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a unique set of values and worldview to mm -hmm. kind of counter that, um, all the pressures. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think, um, you know, we're, all, we're used to seeing Elon kind of counter that. And he says like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm not trying to pump the stock. I don't care about, you know, whatever. And a lot of people might not believe him, but over mm -hmm. time, his message is consistent and his focus mm -hmm. also in what he's doing. Like he doesn't need to be doing what he's doing really. Um, mm -hmm. All the, the hours and the pain, you know, it's just like, it's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that type of individual, it's like, huh, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, and we're talking about the future of humanity that is and it's many decades also going forward. So yeah. sure, let's say things are great for the next 10 or 20 years, but what, what's after that, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely something um, I'm personally concerned about. I think also what's interesting is I never would have imagined that investing in a company would become not just an investment, but it's like, it's, it's so tied to the future of the world that in a sense, I care more about that future of the world than I do about my investments in the company mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it's, it's much more significant, you know, like the mission of the company. And it's interesting how the mission of the company before just transitioning the world to sustainable energy, that's a huge mission in and of itself yep. with huge consequences. Mm -hmm. But then when you add this, the whole AGI AI robots, like this mission, this mm -hmm. is, there, this is, there is, I wouldn't say there is no that is the mission, mission. But, but yeah, it is pretty yeah, much. It really is. The, it really is. The end of missions. It's, it's, I mean, it's like, yeah. It yeah. And when you think of it like that, it's like, man, there, I don't think there has been a company, you know, obviously this is consequential. Um, mm. And we are at these crazy, this, a crazy moment in history, you know, and mm -hmm. lots of things are going to, going to happen and we don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, definitely interesting times. Yeah, mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, um, how about? Um, I'm curious if you. Um, I want to hear your your your, th your thoughts on the stock market, Tesla stock. So we're recording this Monday night, um, and mm -hmm. today Tesla stock dropped. I think over eight percent. Mm -hmm. You know, poor delivery yeah. or delivery numbers as you know, expected. Didn't meet, as, yeah, it didn't yep. meet at least delivery analyst expectations. Missed, AGI. Yeah. AI disappointing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, you know, over the years you've been kind of, you know, taking this counter kind of intuitive approach where you're like with a long-term perspective, you know, dips are opportunities. Mm -hmm. You're just buying, buying, buying. What, what, what's your current thoughts kind of on Tesla stock? Are you still kind of, you know, buying with whatever mm -hmm. money you can come up with? Um, what's your kind of perspective on that? Yep. So, um, I do have some, Letters here from the tax office. I won't go into too much detail there, but I am prioritizing Tesla stock um, at this point in time in terms of buying. I'm, I'm always looking into the long-term future. And at this point in time, as I've said on my channel a million times, I am personally unaware of a better risk-adjusted opportunity in the stock market. It isn't to say that they don't exist. I just don't know of any. And I'm looking into the future, looking at what's happening, looking at the potential, factoring in the worst case scenario, the best case scenario, what I think is probable. And there's nothing that compares. And so if I have some money available to invest, it's all heading into Tesla at this point in time. And I'm expecting over the next decade or more, probably a 10X is somewhere around the threshold, give or take, you know, a few X. But then if we add another decade onto that, add another decade onto that, if you had have asked me in 2016, what do I think my Tesla stock investment is gonna do over the next 30 years? It would be a very different answer to today. Tesla continues to come up with, they just stack an S curve onto an S curve onto an S curve. And I'm modeling Tesla privately out till 2069. And obviously 
the it gets very uncertain but i've got to at least do the exercise what if these bots do scale how how big does a fleet of bots get how does the and it just gets absolutely obscene um and so i don't want to be looking back in 2040 2050 or 2060 and thinking man i really wish i had you know invested a little bit heavier in tesla um, you know, I don't personally need the capital, but I do have intentions for doing some very capital intensive philanthropy in the future. And so I'm trying to snowball my capital as much as possible. And I think that gives me a little bit more of a risk tolerance as well, because I'm not, you know, if I lose it, okay, whatever, it's not going to change my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just, as I said, it's the best risk adjusted opportunity that I'm aware of in the stock market. And it's no contest. Th that being said, at this point in time with the turmoil in the stock, there's bargains left, right and center, you know, yeah. you could take a scatter, scatter approach now and just bang this, grab this, grab this, grab this, and you'll probably be pretty happy in five years time. Mm -hmm. um, but Tesla, it's just, there's been one sequence of events after the next, after the next, it's just been pummeling the stock price. And I personally feel that the stock is massively artificially suppressed. I think it's getting sort of spring loaded. And at some point, you know, when the macroeconomic environment calms down a little bit, there's a little bit less panic and fear. People start looking at Tesla's earnings and looking at their growth and going, wait a minute, what? Are you serious? Mm -hmm. This is a bargain. Like te Tesla at this point in time, I feel is in bargain basement territory. And of course yeah. it still could go a lot lower. I'm, I'm not making predictions over the short term, but it's a head scratcher. I mean, it really is. I just, every spare cent that I can possibly accumulate is going straight in and I'm, you know, I'm even considering the big M word margin. Mar margin. Really. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Got it. Um, no, yeah, yeah. So considering that as an option as well, but Interesting. Um, not in a rush. Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, with Tesla stock, it's so interesting because, you know, Wall Street's not going to give any valuation to to optimists. If any, it'll mm -hmm. be negative, right? Um, yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, for the next five or 10 years, it'll be largely, you know, autos and FSD. Um, mm -hmm. And, but when you look at the bigger picture beyond, let's say, 10 years, and what Tesla is setting up with AI robots, it almost makes like the next five or 10 years, like stock price, like irrelevant, or at least if you have that yes. long enough perspective, yes. you know what I'm saying? It's yes. like, yes. does yes. it really yes. matter? Like <laughs> what the stock price is doing for the next five or 10 years, if Tesla That's solves- That's literally my thinking. Yeah. That's literally my thinking. I mean, th mm -hmm. this is why I was happily buying at all time highs. I, I, I knew, you know, probably a little bit ahead of itself, it'll come back, but I've got a long term, I don't care if I'm paying 1200 pre-split, what's that 400 now, you know, 200, 500, 800, I, I just don't care because I'm not thinking five, 10 years, I'm thinking 10, 20, 30 years into the future. And you're right, I don't believe that Wall Street, the stock market in general is giving any, any credence at all. They're just, they're completely ignoring the possibilities with Tesla bot and AGI, they just, they don't exist. They're not looking out far enough into the future and, and doing the exercise, of what if this actually plays out? And so, I think Tesla is just going to be a company for a very long period of time where there's a huge gap of years between where the stock market thinks Tesla's at and what their future looks like and the reality. Yeah. There's a massive, massive disconnect. Um, and I don't think with Tesla bot and what will eventually become AGI that the market's really going to start getting this for at least half a decade or more yeah. because yeah. they're going to see AI day, we will fill over. It's not very, you know, it's not really going to look like a whole lot of progress. And it's only, I feel like Wall Street and, and most most the general retail investors even, they need to see something happen today to understand that it's going to happen tomorrow. They're not able to look out far enough into the future and, and wait the probabilities of this happening and, and think about, is this possible? And if not, can somebody else catch them, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I understand why, because what Tesla's doing, it needs you need a pretty broad grounding of knowledge in a lot of really nerdy topics to just to even comprehend what's going on. You see a robot and you're just a member of the general public at AI Day 2, you're like, huh? That Boston Dynamics have already done that, you know, mm. I don't get it. But if you've got the additional layers of context and understanding, you go, hang on a minute, <laughs> what they're doing with the brain here is just on a whole other level. So I think it's yeah. going to be a long time with the market not understanding. And I agree. This is why I just, when I have money, I buy Tesla stock. I'm not trying to time it. I know I could probably sit here and wait for a big crash and load up, but it's just like, I'd rather just buy when I've got cash and I don't really care what the price is. You know, if Tesla was at a $5 trillion market cap, I'd still be buying today. And I'd, I'd still be very excited for the prospects, but <laughs> it's much less than that now. So even better returns. Yeah. Interesting. Um, do you have any updated uh, thoughts on crypto? I know, you know, you've in the past seen the potential of crypto, but mm. you've been kind of reserved in terms of investment. Is there any point mm. where crypto comes down that you would say, huh, interesting, uh, you know, I would, 
it'd yeah. be a good investment. I for think you. we're getting close to those those points, but mm. um, there's no way I'm going to be investing in crypto when Tesla's still in this mm. these prices now. Yeah. Some additional context some of the viewers may not know. I did actually previously invest in Bitcoin in 2013 and 14. I allocated about 15% of my net worth. I said, this is high risk, high reward. I can see this thing potentially going to zero or $100,000, whatever. Yeah. I had, you know, Bitcoin in different exchanges. Long story short, I got scammed, I got hacked, and I ended up losing almost all of the Bitcoin. And that was well over 100 Bitcoin. So for me, psychologically, to consider re-entering at a price mm. point instead of 200 Three hundred dollars yeah. for a Bitcoin or something like that. I just don't see the reward there, given the uncertainty of the future. I think crypto is here to stay. Bitcoin's probably here to stay as well, but it's so early and so uncertain and such a volatile asset class that I'm not confident enough to say, okay, there's definitely something here. I'm willing to allocate capital, even though I think the potential upside could be enormous. It's just something. It's very it's still very speculative for me, um, and so still buying Tesla stock every spare cent, but I'm very curious to see what's happening. I've been paying attention to the NFT market out of interest. I kind of might had a hypothesis at the time. <laughs> it looks like most of this is going to be coming down 95, 100% almost from where we are today. I don't say anything, but I just I always test my hypothesis versus reality. And I think we're crypto and this this whole space is going to go through a series where you just to the moon, and it comes back to reality and again and again. And I don't know how many more times this plays out. But I think over the long term, it is here to stay. But it's really hard to pick winners and I can't make any statements with a real high level of confidence. Yeah. 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 I agree. When you compare the investment opportunity to Tesla, it's, it's different. You know, there's so much more uncertainty, I think, um, mm -hmm. where, I mean, Bitcoin max maximalists will tell you there's hundred percent certainty, right? <laughs> but shout out to um, Michael, <laughs> you know, Michael is somebody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is investment advice. Uh, yeah. Um, I just, yeah, sell, your just, house, sell everything. No. Exactly. I just, I think it's on a different level. Um, yeah. compared to Tesla though. Um, uh, I know I, I was reading a recent thread of yours about the, um, crater economy and mm -hmm. you seem very bullish on kind of the future of content creators kind of taking mm. over more of the market mm. as a oh, yeah. pretty much like, you yeah. know, release products that are already selling just to their mm -hmm. audience. Um, mm -hmm. how, how, like, how big do you think this, where, where is this headed? The creator economy? Is it like, it's going to yeah. eat everything. I, I think I really, mm. it's going to eat everything. I mean, I really genuinely believe that. Um, one great example, Mr. Beast, who, I've, I've began watching a lot of content creators on YouTube, not because I actually want to watch the content, but I want to see what they're doing and understand how they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Beast is a great example. I'm sure you've heard of him. Yeah. Um, biggest yeah. YouTuber basically. Uh, and just been reinvesting in the channel. No one can really compete. So Mr. Beast, the, the brand, the channel launched Beast Burger and overnight they yeah. opened a bunch of like ghost restaurants where they just using someone else's kitchen to cook their orders. And out of nowhere, just simultaneously opened a few hundred stores. In its second year, Beast Burger is going to do over $100 million of revenue. And every time Mr. Beast posts a new video, he's got an audience of 50 plus million viewers. It's like 10 Super Bowl ads every video. Hey, we've got a new product. Bang, check it out. And if you're a fan, I'm already going to buy a burger. Why would I go to McDonald's when I can buy a, a Beast Burger instead? And I don't think people are understanding this. The, the distribution costs are effectively zero. Customer acquisition is almost nothing. You've already got the trust here. And I don't see a way for traditional brands to compete unless they themselves are creating content. Because everyone watching this will understand. There's YouTubers that they really enjoy. There's other content creators that they really enjoy watching. And if this person were to drop a product that they already buy and it's comparable in terms of quality and price, would you rather a big corporation, a faceless corporation, get that revenue? Or would you rather help the person that you already enjoy watching their content? Uh, I don't see how legacy brands will compete with this unless they're creating their own content. You know, maybe Coca-Cola has their own podcasts and has a huge thing and people love the Coke podcast and they'll still stay loyal to the brand. But if not, one after the other, and we're starting to see all kinds of weird convergences. The YouTube stars doing boxing, right, and making more than most professional boxers would ever make in their career. A bunch of amateurs punching each other in the head. Next minute, they're taking home 20, 30, 40 million dollars. Uh, I think people are massively under undervaluing how much power, I guess is probably the word and influence that creators mm -hmm. can have. And I just don't see a traditional brand being able to compete with certain, certain stuff. You know, if you're known for a certain thing, if you're a YouTuber and you talk about health and nutrition, everyone wants to know, what do you take? What supplements next minute mm -hmm. you release your own supplement, 
it's actually good, people are going to buy it. And if you've got 10 million subscribers and you're a GP on YouTube, suddenly you no longer need to be working as a GP. You can actually build out a huge supplement company. Um, mm -hmm. I know if David Huberman or uh, Andrew Huberman or David Sinclair mm -hmm. were to start releasing products, they would have $100 million companies almost overnight because they have a wide audience. They're interested in health. Everyone's Every time I mention some of the stuff that I've taken for energy, everyone's begging me, what product do you use? What brand do you use? Hmm. And, uh, you know, the potential there is just uh, astronomical. I don't think yeah. people are getting it. What, yeah. What's your what's your game plan with YouTube? Um, like, I know finance, investing Tesla is, is one area, one niche. Are you happy with that kind of niche to stay there and to do your thing? Or are you tempted at all to kind of, you know, go into other areas that might be even broader and bigger? Yeah, um, definitely in the future, I'll be expanding a lot of different things on topics that I am interested in, passionate about that I'd like to discuss. My limiting factor until fairly recently has been energy. Since we last spoke, maybe two years ago, I've more than doubled my energy and the way that I measure that is my work capacity and ability to recover. So I can do qu twice as much in a day now versus two years ago. And I'm at a point now where I do actually have enough time and energy to start adding things on and, and going down other rabbit holes. I'm all in on this Tesla content and I'm going to be covering this for decades. That's not going anywhere. But I, I'm trying to sort of hack my life and go, if I can extract more energy out of the day and more productivity and do more, I'm just going to keep adding things on and on and on over time. There's a lot of areas that I'm very passionate about, some that I'm kind of knowledgeable, but not even close to expert level on yet. But in the next few years, you might see a few new channels popping up. Uh, some of them may not be able to appear on YouTube, but others will. And um, yeah, I think I'm just kind of in my mind, I want to have a positive impact on as many people as I can. Yeah. And, you know, there's some knowledge I have on Tesla, which can be useful to some people, but there's a lot of other things that I convey a little bit on Patreon, but I don't really get to, to sort of talk about on YouTube. And I know most viewers don't care. So I'm going to drive people away if I start going on too many off topic rants, but I would like to share that stuff in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot more to come. We're just getting started. It. Yeah, it's mm. like, um, yeah, I've watched Mr. Beast, his interviews for past few years, I've, I've watched a lot of his and mm -hmm. he, it bothers me in a sense because he talks about like, you know, the opportunity he's seizing as something mm -hmm. that's so big and it mm -hmm. makes so much sense. Um, it makes me question sometimes like what I'm doing. Like, I'm like, <laughs> am I being irresponsible? Like, should I like, mm -hmm. you know, basically shoot for the stars, you know? Mm. Um, I, I battle it, with this as well, yeah. Continue, but I, I have the same, same thought. Yeah, yeah, because I'm like, he, he's definitely tapping into something that, and, and other big, you know, content creators that is on a different scale and level. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, and I'm comfortable and I like where I'm at. It's like, it's, it's nice. Mm -hmm. I don't have to stress. I don't have employees or a company. I just like chill mm -hmm. and, you know, come yep. up with content and, it, and it's, it's, it's nice for me, but I do have this mm -hmm. question mark in the back of my head where I'm like, am I like, I don't say missing out, but being irresponsible, like for not mm -hmm. going for something much, much mm -hmm. bigger and tapping mm -hmm. into something else. But, um, yeah, it's something that it bought, it just, it's like a, constant like bothering like you know yeah like something just in the back of my head always it's just yeah mm -hmm. so anyways when I, you talk about content econ yeah, yeah when you talk about content economy all this stuff like yeah it just it, it resonates a lot i think um yeah I, i'm definitely cognizant there's a because i'm the same i think you realize there is some un untapped potential that you have and you're very limited in focusing on a really small narrow niche and the, the thing that I battle with the most is I don't want to be disingenuous about anything and I can't mm. do anything but be me 100%. Mm. And I know that there's a lot of things that are against best practices that limit growth. You know, if, if I wanted to start a more generic channel in the future, I could easily, you know, try and be a Graham Stephan or meet Kevin and expand just even in the finance space quite a bit. And there's many levels beyond that as well. And I am very confident that I could execute a strategy no matter what I was focused on that could just reach a audience that's 10, a hundred times larger. But in order to do that, I can't see a path without me having to conform to the algorithm or just not be my full and genuine self. Um, but it's something that I, I definitely think I kind of battle with a little bit as well, because mm. yeah, I mean, you have a gigantic brain. I think don't, people don't realize quite the, the intellectual titan you are. And 
I, I don't say that to blow smoke up your ass. I genuinely see what you're capable of. I understand your history with the app store, seeing the opportunity and executing. And I know that if you were to go, you know what, let's just hundred X what we're doing now, yeah. you'd do it. Yeah. You would execute on it and, and do something. And it's just, is it worth kind of going on a different path to, to reach more people and have more impact? And it's something that I battle with because mm-hmm. I can't yeah. not be me, but I know if I was able to turn it down and, and do things, go on a different path and reach a much wider audience and probably have a bigger net positive impact. Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I wanted to ask this, I was going to ask you offline, but I figured I'd just ask you right now, um, mm-hmm. how is your merch sales doing? Like, is that a decent, significant size of, you know, revenue coming yeah, in? Or I can is bring it, just it up for of, you now if you want. It's pretty, yeah, I'm just pretty curious, minor, is it, to be honest. Is it, worth, is it worth, like, you know, something it's, to invest not, your time and not, energy? Not, well, actually, yes. If, yeah. if I put the time in, when I was actively okay. promoting merch last year as an experiment, I just thought I'd just mm-hmm. pump merch constantly. And I don't just mean... And so, I mean, like talk about the merch uniquely in each video rather than just copy and pasting the same promo. Mm-hmm. It's much more effective to do that and integrate it. Yeah. When I was doing that, I was selling hundreds of dollars of merch every single day, mm-hmm. which is okay. a lot. If we're posting a daily yeah. video, it adds up to a lot. If I took the time to do merch designs and hire artists instead of whipping them together myself, I could probably be making more income, significantly more income from merch sales alone than all other combined revenue sources by a massive margin. Mm-hmm. It's just that... I'm not interested in creating regular new merch and promoting it constantly. I'll do new things. Yeah. I'm more just focused on the videos and I'm leaving a lot of money on the table there. But I think for most creators, mm-hmm. if you haven't, if you have fans rather than viewers, or it's a subject that people are very passionate about, people love merch. They love to support creators. And if you've got compelling designs and they're fresh and new and unique, people love it. Um, mm-hmm. And you don't need to do a huge conversion to, to get a reasonable, you know, if you're posting very frequent videos and you're mentioning your merch every time, it doesn't take that many people clicking through. If you've got a five or $10 profit per merch item that mm-hmm. for it to really start adding up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a lot of YouTube creators that significantly more than half their revenue comes from merch, even if they've got ads and sponsorships and placements and stuff like that. Um, huge untapped potential, for, I think for a lot of creators. Yeah. Um, yeah and yeah. obviously. I have an unfair advantage in terms of the Elon and Tesla nerds because if you want a Tesla's meme shirt, there's not that many places you'll you'll find them. Well, there wasn't anyway. It's probably yeah. changed a lot now. I've seen a lot of people copying my designs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But there was a period there where if you wanted a don't bet against Elon shirt, I mean, there's only one of those to find. I think that that yeah. unit alone has sold well in excess of 4,000 individual um, items, which is stunning t- to imagine. They are great conversation starters though. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you make some yeah. great designs. I definitely appreciate it. Um, yeah, fun stuff. Um, it's uh, yeah, great catching up on, especially right after AI Day and getting your thoughts. Um, I'm sure mm. people will um, appreciate getting into your head a bit um, and a conversation like this just to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Um, I'll go ahead and link to your YouTube channel in the video description below. Any other kind of last um, kind of words or comments before we end? I would probably encourage everyone watching who's really not buying into the thesis around the bot and the AGI, try and educate yourself on as much as you can to really make a good assessment of whether or not Tesla's on the path and how likely it is that they'll achieve this. Because even if you don't buy it now, just if you can put yourself in a situation where you can definitively, you know what, they're wrong, I don't disagree, but you have enough information to really make that judgment, I think you'll be in a much better position to see the potential opportunity here. Uh, because as I mentioned, I really do think you need a lot of fairly specialized knowledge on a broad range of really nerdy things to, to grasp the opportunity. And as I said, the bot AGI dwarfs everything else in Tesla's future um, by all, multiple orders of magnitude. And the implications of this are ridiculous. You know, market cap, it just, it gets bizarre, but I think a lot of people are having a hard time making that leap because they don't have, there's too many gaps in their knowledge to really kind of draw any reasonable conclusions about what they're seeing. Uh, but don't miss out on understanding the opportunity, guys. That's my final word. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Um, yeah. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for chatting again. Um, loved it. And we'll see you, um, see you later and see you, everyone else who's watching. Thanks. See you, guys.